Hello, and welcome to Eyes on Success, a weekly program covering a wide variety of topics of interest to people with vision loss. I'm Nancy Goodman Torpy. And I'm Pete Torpy. I think the two best skills that I've learned as being a visually impaired uh, professional uh, and just even being uh, low vision is number one is adaptability. And then that grit and determination or resilience to change. So being able to accept change, being able to cope with it and still, you know, keep at it and working hard. Very important skills. Thanks. And we'll learn a bit more during the show about what made today's guest tick and what made him so successful in life. We'll speak with Fernando Albertorio, a blind chemist turned entrepreneur and philanthropist. He is also one of the co-founders of the Sunu Band, a device worn on the wrist to provide tactile navigation cues to the blind. We'll speak with Fernando about his journey, his philosophy, and how his drive and motivation have opened up opportunities for him. But first for our tip of the week. This week's tip comes from Fernando Albertorio. Explore your camera features on your phone because they're getting much more intelligent and you will find new technologies that will help you with object detection and recognizing everyday objects to even providing navigation support, whether you're indoors or outdoors. So keep an eye on your phone's camera, open it every once in a while, play with it, because there's new technology coming. Uh, and in fact, I think you guys are interviewing Paul Ruvalo. Yes. I work with Paul in his Project Clue. We actually had Paul Ruvalo on last week's show talking about the Clue app. Support for Eyes on Success is provided by... NaviLens, a four-color QR code designed to be located and read from up to 60 feet away without the need to focus on it. Now, using augmented reality, NaviLens 360 Vision locates the NaviLens codes in a 3D space available for iPhone and soon for Android. More at navilens.com. You are listening to Eyes on Success. Success, 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 success. Let's start by meeting Fernando and learning about his involvement with Sunu Band. My name is Fernando Albertorio. I'm a technologist, serial entrepreneur, advocate for um, education and opportunities for people with low vision and blindness in science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, I'm a technology enthusiast but also uh, I'm a business consultant in the areas of digital technologies and products. And you're related with the Sunu Band technology? That's right. I am one of the co-inventors of Sunu, actually. Um, I joined the project back in 2014 when I met uh, one of the initial inventors, Marco Trujillo, uh, who came from Guadalajara, Mexico to a program here in Boston called the Mass Challenge. And so Marco had been initially developing the Sunu Band at, at a school for blind children in Guadalajara. Um, they had come to Boston with a prototype. Uh, they had won a couple competitions and had won into the, what is called the Mass Challenge. It's a technology startup competition here in Boston. And I was uh, one of the mentors for this program. And that's pretty much where our journey started. And you yourself are blind, I take it. I'm actually uh, low vision. So I have ocular cutaneous albinism and I am originally from Puerto Rico uh, where there's a high, actually there's a high prevalence of people with albinism in Puerto Rico. Can you translate that into what amount of functional vision or not that you have? Yeah, sure. So on the Logmar scale, uh, where 2020 is normal vision, I have 2200. But you're probably able to read by holding the book close to your face. And I don't know if you use a cane or not. That's correct. So for visual acuity, um, yeah, so I have the nystagmus, the low vision. Um, I respond really well to magnification. So my entire life I've used magnifiers, bioptic reading glasses. 
for seeing the blackboard and in the classroom. And then for mobility, I've had pretty enough functional vision to be mobile and navigate my surroundings. However, sometimes I would actually have accidents to the upper body. So I would forget to look up or run into a, a tree branch or a signpost. Uh, and hence the reason why I really got very interested with the technology for Sunu because Sunu is offering a way to improve, enhance my awareness in a way that's discreet. And so having that additional channel of information that complemented my low vision was really cool. We did an entire episode about the Sunu band uh, in May of 2020, but can you just briefly recap what it does and what it is and what's, what's so special about it? Of course. Uh, yeah, thank you for doing the episode. Um, yeah, the Sunu band uh, is a smart mobility aid, smart electronic travel aid that uses a sonar sensor uh, built into essentially a smart watch or a smart band uh, that a person wears around their wrist. And the intent here is to augment the person's awareness or perception to obstacles in the environment. Using sonar ultrasound, the system detects obstacles in the environment and then relays vibration feedback back to the individual so that they know how close or far away they are to an obstacle. So in other words, when they're in a space and something is getting closer to them, like say furniture or a, if they're outdoors, like a signpost or tree branches, uh, the more vibrations they feel on their wrist, that translates to being closer to the object or, or closer in proximity. And the least pulses that they feel on the wrist, then that means that they're further away. And this can be used either in conjunction with a white cane or a guide dog, or presumably in your case, just to give you enhanced awareness of obstacles you might hit with your head, but you don't feel like you need a cane or a dog to handle the information at your feet. That's right. I mean, like we, we started uh, developing the product uh, and when I joined in in 2014, it's very important that we, we learn early on in our development that, you know, we're not here to substitute the cane or, or substitute it completely. We're here to enhance it and do it in a way that is functional for either people who travel with the white cane or if they travel with a guide dog or if they're like me who have low vision and just want to have that extra layer of awareness. Support for Eyes on Success is made possible in part by our corporate partners. Find out more about partnership opportunities by sending an email to hosts at eyesonsuccess.net. Today's focus topic is Fernando's experiences as a chemist, an entrepreneur, and a philanthropist. When we were setting up this talk, with you, Fernando, you mentioned that you were intrigued with the fact that you just found out that we were both physicists and you wanted to talk because you had some scientific background and all. Can you tell us a little bit about your background then? Of course. So I got my love for science from my dad, who is a pilot. And early on when I was a child, I, you know, I grew up around airplanes and he would take me up on his airplane. Um, and I got to experience that sensation of flight. And he always nurtured that curiosity of me for science to the point where, you know, I learned a lot about aviation, even though we were both aware that I would never be able to become a pilot or receive my, 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 my pilot certification. Uh, but nonetheless, it didn't stop, stop us from, from flying together. And I thought that was a really cool experience that lended a lot of um, sense of independence, a uh, sense of accomplishment for me when I was growing up that when I became interested in science, I wanted to pursue a career in chemistry. And, and much to the dismay of my teachers in chemistry at the university, uh, or at least one of them, uh, who recommended I should study something more safer like accounting, uh, <laughs> I basically said, no, I want to study chemistry. I know I can do this. Um, I know that I can figure out the best way to work in the laboratory I do the work that I need to do and be one of the best grades in the class. And eventually I did that. Um, I graduated uh, magna cum laude from my university. I then went on to do a research internship at the NIH, at the uh, National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. Um, from there, I spent two years working at the government. 
And then I did my PhD in chemistry and I was always the only person with low vision or with some vision impairment um, in the sciences. I've never met anyone else in the sciences who had a similar condition as myself. And that's why I kind of like, when I saw your bio and I read that, I'm like, I just want to meet other scientists, other people who've done this as well. I wish I had that experience when I was going through, through school and through graduate school. Today, what I do is I actually am on the board of a scholarship organization called Team C Possibilities to help build mentorship opportunities for students who are blind to low vision, who are either starting out their college years or who are going into graduate school. It's interesting, as you noted, you were discouraged early on by some cited teachers and professors based on their assumptions about what a visually impaired person could and could not do. And who knows better than you know yourself or ourselves what we can or cannot do. And it's very good that you didn't take their advice and decided that you really could overcome whatever challenges would be put in your way. Yeah. It just comes with the territory of being low vision or living with a disability that you would find people who will encourage you and those who will doubt you or discourage you. And then those who would set the bar just a little bit lower for you because they just don't understand what is it that you're capable of doing and what you need uh, to accomplish the job or, or, or do what you need to get done. Um, I've always found it when I've come into these situations that it's a teachable moment. And so why not provide the best that we can as a community to educate, to make more allies. And that's one of the reasons that we do this show. And one of our major focuses of topics is people who have interesting careers. And many of them are scientists and you can find them by going to our website and entering science or STEM, or whatever other field, you know, lawyer, that you're interested in, in finding a person who's done that career. And so we're hoping that we can encourage young people, you know, who are hearing from their faculty, oh, you can't do this, chemistry is dangerous, that, yeah, you can do chemistry or anything else you set your mind to. And here's somebody who's done it, and maybe you can get some pointers on how to jumpstart your success path. That's right. Just out of curiosity, how did you go from a PhD in chemistry to being a serial entrepreneur and consultant and everything else you just said? So the story goes, uh, I graduated with my degree in chemistry, uh, finished my PhD in about four years. And then, you know, I was like trying to decide what I was going to do for my career. I really wanted to be in academia, to be a research professor one day. And so I, I took a postdoc in physics at Harvard. So I came to Boston in 2006 uh, to do independent research at Harvard University in the, in the physics department. I did that for a couple of years and got some grants and funding for my research project. Uh, and I was also teaching at the university as a teaching fellow. And the bubble broke. And... A lot of the positions that I was looking at and academic institutions around the country basically dried up. So here I am trying to figure out, okay, I'm a postdoc. What am I going to do with my career? I need to kind of further develop myself and figure out what's my plan B. And then, you know, I, I, I went and took the nuts and bolts course of entrepreneurship at MIT and realized that, wow, I'm much more of an entrepreneur than I, than I am a academic. And that kind of started me on this journey of transitioning from the bench to business. It wasn't easy, but it was a very interesting journey. Um, having learned some of the basics of business through a, a course, a free course at MIT and through books as well, or, or other, other online resources to then forming my very first company in around 2010. And then winning competitions and getting into accelerator programs like Techstars uh, and then Y Combinator that basically are very hard to get into. They're harder to get into than business school. And being able to then use the stuff that I learned at those programs to further develop my companies and make them successful. Well, it just goes to show you that there are many paths to success. And if you have an open mind and you're willing to look at different alternatives, and then work hard, 
you can ultimately find that success? I think the two best skills that I've learned as being a visually impaired uh, professional uh, and just even being uh, low vision is number one is adaptability, being able to hack your environment to make things work for you. So fixing your broken environment, whether it's with a simple solution or, or a technology, and then that grit and determination or resilience to change. So being able to accept change, being able to cope with it and still, you know, keep at it and working hard. Very important skills. Thanks. You talk about having support from people and that's really important. I always give my parents a lot of credit for teaching me to be independent, letting me overcome challenges on my own with them being there as a safety net and offering me the support that I needed. But they always let me do whatever I wanted to do and always encourage that. So one of the things and the reason why I love working with, uh, with Dan Berlin at, at, at the TNC Possibilities is that, you know, we're building a mentorship network. Uh, we have students are coming in. Uh, they may be computer science major or political science majors or lawyers, but they're all finding areas to help each other. Uh, we connect them then with folks like through our monthly mentor calls, we connect them with professionals in various fields to provide them an opportunity to see that, you know, just because you're blind or visually impaired doesn't mean that you're going to end up working for an organization that is serving the blind and visually impaired, though that's great, but there is a lot more out there for you. You could become a real estate agent or you could study law or you can become a chemist. And the idea is that we want to build a network of mentors who then keep paying that forward. And it's important to be able to know that there are some existence proof of people out there that are doing these jobs and have these professions and also the ability to network with them and see how they overcame these challenges so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. People have a variety of tools at their disposal and you got to pick the right tool for the job and maybe someone found a solution that would work better for your particular issue. Exactly, exactly. One of the most gratifying parts of doing this podcast is when we're able to make connections. So, for example, a young woman in Malaysia contacted us and she said, I really, really, really want to be a pharmacist, but my government is making this difficult for me and they don't want me to sit for the exams. And, you know, what do you know about being a visually impaired pharmacist? Well, of course, we knew nothing, but we nosed around. We found a blind pharmacist in Wisconsin. We interviewed him. We connected him with her. And, you know, we kept following her for a while. And one day she said, this is great. You know, they're letting me take my exams and, and I'll be a licensed pharmacist. Wow. And that's just so gratifying to be able to make those connections. That's really powerful when you can make those connections and then it translates into, into something happening in even another country around the world farther away. I mean, it's really cool. So it sounds like you and I had pretty similar experiences growing up. My sight was about like yours when I was young. I had 2200, 2400 vision, depending on when and how you counted. And, you know, I basically didn't use a cane, although it probably would have been helpful crossing streets. So people would know that it was a blind man crossing who might not have seen the red light or something. But basically, I did the same thing, looking closely at books. And then when I went to graduate school, I lost most of my sight. But by then... I had a lot of these skills under control and it was just a matter of learning cane lessons and how to do things in a different way. Yeah. When I was developing Sunu and working those early days, um, I actually got more curious for myself about orientation and mobility. So I shadowed a few O&Ms during their training. Um, I even took some O&M training a bit myself, got a, a bit more cane training just in case. And it kind of opened up a new appreciation because, you know, when I was a kid, I, I, I was like, no, I don't want to take any, any other lessons. I mean, I'm, I'm okay. I can, I can walk. I can, I can orient myself. I'm totally fine. I don't need, I don't need any, any tools, any, any other mobility aids. And sometimes I was a bit embarrassed to use my magnifier. And nowadays, when I look at back, uh, I look at the use of technology, you know, technology is there to help fix that broken environment. Yes, um, yes. It's helping me solve 
a problem that I need to solve in that moment. And I should feel really good about using it. It should feel proud of it. I shouldn't feel afraid or stigmatized or embarrassed to use it. And so I actually, you know, had a kind of a renewed interest in, in the white cane and learning how to use it and being, you know, being much more proud that, you know, if I need to use it as an identity cane or, and then the situations that definitely need it, I can use it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I find the white cane to be kind of an interesting aid. When I was living in Rochester, I used my cane when I went to work, of course, and I was on my own, but Outside the house, I was mostly with the family or with Nancy, and I rarely used the cane because she guides me very well, and it was very natural, and it was very easy. It just, it wasn't that I was throwing away the cane because I was embarrassed or anything. But when I came to live here in Colorado, I decided to start using the cane mostly as an identifier because I wear glasses, and although I can't see anything, I look at people when they talk, and they don't immediately comprehend that I can't see. So I use the cane somewhat as a flag, but also I see that it, it helps in many situations to avoid confusion. We're at the supermarket, for example, and I'll be holding onto the cart and Nancy will run over to some other aisle to get something and some customer will come up and say, excuse me, can you move? And I don't know which way to move. I don't have my cane and it looks kind of silly. So I find it a very useful tool just to cue in other people. And then as you say, sometimes you need it. Exactly, exactly. The other thing about using the cane here in Colorado is we moved from a pretty sparse suburb of Rochester, New York, to Golden, Colorado, which is filled with tourists. And, you know, walking down the sidewalk, there's just a lot of people. And if they don't see the cane, then they assume we'll get out of their way. Well, that's a little bit of a challenge. But if they see the cane, man, they just move to the side and, and it's great. And they're very polite and they you know, inform their children of what they're experiencing because they may never have seen a white cane before. And, and it just makes life a whole lot easier for everybody. People who are sighted also um, need to understand that if someone's outside with a white cane, it's because A, they know how to navigate their spaces. They've been trained. So when you're offering help, it's not okay to simply just grab a person and assume. Ask uh, how can I help you or what do you need? Um, and that still provides the person who is blind with the control to determine exactly how they want to be helped, if they want to be helped at all. Yes. I've been in funny situations where people just presume rather than asking. I've had occasionally when I was waiting on a street corner for a friend, some old lady will walk up to me and say, oh, Sonny, would you like help crossing the street? And I'll say, no, 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 no. She's, oh, I'll help you. It's okay. And she'll grab my arm. She'll walk me across the street and then leave me there. And then I just wait until I think she's gone and I cross back to where I was waiting. Correct. Correct. And so that's why tools like Sunu Band, you know, hopefully with the connectivity of the device, the discreteness of it can provide more information, more details about the environment. Um, you know, right now it tells you what street you're crossing through our mobile app. It'll tell you if you're crossing a certain avenue, which direction you're going. And hopefully that lends to a better experience overall for everybody. Do you use the Sunu Band on a regular basis yourself or just for special situations? I, I use it on a regular basis and along with the app as well. Well, that sounds like it comes in quite handy for you and it must feel very good being one of the uh, people who started the company and got it off the ground. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and, and again, you know, we hope it's, it can be a tool that could be helpful to people, uh, regardless if they're blind or low vision, and that it can be customizable to the things that they need. And if you want to learn more about the Sunu Band, go back to episode 2019, in which we talked about it for an entire half an hour. You are listening to Eyes on Success. 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 Now for this week's final item, how to learn more about Fernando Albertorio, his work, the Sunu Band, Team C possibilities, and how to contact him directly. Fernando, if people wanted to find out more about the Sunu Band, where would you send them? Oh, yeah, they can visit Sunu on the web at www.sunu.com. Um, and there's a lot of information 
testimonials, a lot of reviews on the website. Um, and you can always Google Sunu. Um, it's been tried and tested by experts in the field from you know the NFB, Jernigan Center in Baltimore to various organizations worldwide for the blind. Um, there's a lot of reviews written about Sunu Ban. Uh, so hopefully that could provide a lot more context to people who are new to it to determine if it's the right tool for them. How do you spell Sunu so people can search for it? Oh, good. Um, yeah, Sunu is S-U-N-U, uh, S-U-N-U. And do you have a social media presence? We do. Yeah, you can find Sunu on Facebook, it's just, um, Facebook, and then just look for Sunu. Um, and um, it's also on Instagram as well. So you also talked about Team C possibilities. How would people get more information about that? Yeah, Team C possibilities is available on the web uh, by searching uh, Team C possibilities all together dot com. Um, and then on the website, you can learn more about Dan Berlin and his team uh, of endurance athletes that do a variety of challenges every year. Obviously, with COVID, things have slowed down. But right now, um, the plan is to pick up a few more challenges pretty soon. And then on the other side, you can learn about the scholarship. Applications uh, had closed now for this year's cohort, but applications for the scholarship open every year. So you can learn more about the program and also um, see the current list of scholars. You said you like making connections. If people wanted to contact you directly, how would they do that? Of course, yeah. I'm, I'm on the web as well uh, at FernandoAlbertoria.com. Can you spell that? That's longer than Sunu. Yes, uh, Fernando, F-E-R-N-A-N-D-O, Albertorio, A-L, B as in boy, E-R-T-O-R-I-O, dot com. That's my website and my blog. I talk about design, user experience for accessibility, as well as startups, technology. Um, and you can always reach me at Fernando at FernandoAlbertoria.com. And of course, if you're looking for any of that contact information or those resources, you can find them in the show notes associated with this episode at www.eyesonsuccess.net. That's it for show number 2135. Next week on Eyes on Success, we'll be talking about combining computer science skills with social science problems. Bhavya Shah grew up in India where blind students were often dissuaded from certain studies and careers and where many textbooks could not be obtained in an accessible format. We'll speak with Bhavya about how he overcame these challenges and how he now combines his skills in computer science with his interest in social science to contribute to various research projects. And Bhavya is quite a spectacular individual whom we talked with several years ago, and it will be fun to hear more about his journey since next week. You've been listening to Eyes on Success, hosted and produced by Nancy Goodman Torpy and Peter Torpy. You can access the full archive of previous shows, subscribe to the podcast, and much more by going to our website, www.eyesonsuccess.net. If you have questions about anything you've heard on the show or have suggestions for future shows, send an email to hosts at eyesonsuccess.net. Thank you for listening and have a nice day.